o tēnei koutou katoa, uh, kou te mihi tua tahi ki te rangatira ko pō, uh, tua rua rā he mihi ki ngā mana whenua o te tāgiwa, um, kou te mihi tua toru ki ngā mana hiri, uh, hei uri ahau nō Ngāti Pikeo mei tainui, uh, tēnei tātou katoa. So, um, today I'm going to take you through a presentation, and what I'm going to do in the presentation is I'm going to create some building blocks, so I'm going to create some founding concepts, and then and uh, to take you through to some conclusions. Um, just a note, I've, I've developed this presentation with the idea that some people don't have much knowledge of te ao Māori. I'm covering engineering aspects too, so I'm also assuming people who don't have too much knowledge about engineering uh, might be able to understand things too. So, um, and that way, if you're an engineer, this might be pretty simple to you. If you're coming out of Māori studies or Māori studies background, it's probably pretty, pretty simple to you too. But it's probably the creative synergy between those two areas that I'm most interested in exploring. So, this picture here is um, basically all of our whakapapa. It's all of our genealogy. What that is, is the a current picture of the um, genetic history of all living things on the planet, which shows us all originating down here from a original, um, uh, an original single-celled uh, organism way back four billion years ago. What it shows is that uh, from that, there's been a proliferation of life and a proliferation of different species. And humans are down here. We're just one little part of the, the whole big picture, and uh, of that uh, you know elf, uh, unfolding of, of creation. And this, I think, links pretty well to a Tao Māori way of seeing the world, where we see all living things are our whānau, and they're our relations. And uh, this shows us that that worldview is correct. Um, all living things are our cousins, um, however distant. And, but it also helps frame the way Māori see the world as non-humans, um, animals, plants and so forth, as also people, albeit non-human people. So it's a way of framing and seeing the world that's um, a little bit different from how most Western perspectives frame that world. This takes us to the next question, question where did all of this start? What enabled this um, flourishing of life to happen and unfold. And then we look at the life progenitors. So from a Māori perspective, they're referred to as ngā atua, also as ngā tipuna, which means ancestors. And I'm also pulling here on some Western tradition in terms of the spheres, which I will go into. So here, I'm not sure if you can see the faces in that, in that image, but here at the... Um, um, here at the top, uh, we have Papa Tuanuku, which is basically the, the earth, R Ranginui, uh, the sky, Tangaroa, the waters. And then if we lay over this a, a more of a scientific way of thinking about these things, Papa Tuanuku, the earth, that's often thought of as the lithosphere. Uh, Ranganui, the celestial sphere, um, Tarawhiri Mate, um, that's the air, the atmosphere, and Tangaroa, the hydrosphere. So there's a strong linkage between different ways of thinking, but there's quite similar there's similarities or connections. <clears throat> now the origin of the spheres in Western tradition is, uh, is quite an old tradition um, where the world was also thought of as in spheres, and that's where science has taken their very ideas of spheres from. So the very foundation of Western science itself has a cosmological foundation, very similar to Te Ao Māori in the way these terms are used. But the, the key element of this is, altogether, this is the biosphere. It's the home place of all human and non-human people. So it's the, the home place from that perspective. Now what I now want to step into with that foundation in place is looking at what guides the relationships between spheres, between humans and non-humans. And I'm just going to throw in some core principles of how to think about this. And this is pulling on two core Māori concepts. Uh, for Māori, these are always well 
uh, these are well understood and commonly used terms, um, mostly around Modi. Um, first of all, I'll be covering Modi. So just to give you an idea what Modi is, so here we have Tangata people, and here we have a, a case of a excessive nutrients being put on the ground. Let's say it might be uh, currently the Canterbury Plains. And what we have then is we have our environment uh, is diminished. And in this case, it's a stream. Um, and in that stream, we've got algae growing. And so what we say is that life supporting capacity, the capacity of that water to hold, to create and generate life is diminished. So from a Maori perspective, we say that the Modi of that water has been diminished. But at the same time, that same action leads to water being contaminated. So in this case, we say that, which then affects people. So the idea is then people's modi is diminished. So this is this idea that if you take a negative action, a negative action comes around back to you. And this is utu. Um, and it's an idea of balances. Imbalances always need to be addressed. And with a negative action, a negative action will follow. The same thing can work the other way. So here we have people taking positive actions. And in this case, they're restoring a stream margin back into a uh, native um, forest. And what we can say is that stream, as a consequence, its modi gets increased. So the modi of the environment um, in in increases. Once, once again, that water quality might be improved. And at the same time, you know what you can harvest from that stream, such as mahingakai, or it's tuna, eels, or other species from that stream, once again, that too becomes flourishing again. So more life is created, which then flows back to people. Um, so then person's motives increased. Once again, or two, the balance is restored, a positive action with a positive outcome. Now, one thing to cover here is um, around Modi is Modi can has two things and uh, elements, or at least two elements, certainly when you look at it through a Western lens. One is parts of Modi can be measured. So you could measure the health of a stream or things like that um, using all sorts of instruments, and it can tell you the health of that water. But other parts of it can't be measured. So these are the parts like the emotional connection you might have for it or the relationship you have with that stream. So Modi has these two elements. Now, the next one I want to cover is mana. And so here we have people again, that they take a negative action. And here we have our non-human family. So the ngahiri, the forests, why waters, whenua land. And if we act in ways that negatively um, impact them, then we think of their mana or their dignity being diminished. Likewise, to create that balance, our dignity, our mana, is in turn diminished. Same thing, working the other way. If we act positively, if we build, uh, act in ways that builds the dignity of our non-human family, whether it's the animals and plants or uh, forests, then once again, um, our, that mana is increased. And, uh, uh, well, I've got a negative on those things, but they should be positives. Um, that those two uh, are increased. Once again, back to balance. So just with those two core concepts in mind and the previous concepts around genealogy, whakapapa, the interconnection of all things, there's some Māori environmental ethics that pop out of this. The first is um, encouraging people to act in ways that enhance the mana and modi of the relationship between the human sphere and atua sphere. The ne next one is to act in ways that um, avoid acting in ways that diminish the mana and modi between human sphere and the Atua spheres. And aim for reciprocal or symbiotic um, connections and relationships between those spheres. And aim for ascending imbalances. So this is where you're doing positive actions to get positive outcomes continually rather than descending imbalances or utu, which is more of a revenge cycle where you're acting negatively and expecting negative consequences. And this also, is how I see this as kind of in a most simple way, I've not gone into complexity, but uh, as a foundation for environmental monitoring and modelling. So if you can define what your spheres are, and it could be the hydrosphere, tangaroa, um, and the papatuanuki, the land, 
um, and determining the nature of the relationships between them and how you understand them. So that's that reciprocal connections between them. And also how you measure those relationships is what I'm particularly interested in and how you qualitatively express those relationships. The next step I want to talk to is around the relationship between Māori and technology. Um, and to, to, this is sort of another conceptual framing that, lay, that layers on those previous ones that I've outlined. And just some basic principles. So what happens when two cultures meet? So on the left-hand side, we've got culture A, and culture A meets culture B. Now, if culture A is an open door to culture B, then the beliefs, traditions, and practices of that other culture can flow into that culture. And what you have happen is that culture then creates culture C. So culture A turns into culture C, which is a bit of a blend of both cultures. And then you have uh, what you see here is you have a combination of parts of the original culture, and then you've got what they call syncretic culture, which is where, culture, where, where parts of the cultures have been combined and they've changed, and then you've got new elements to the culture. So this is um, this process of where, where cultures sort of fuse or integrate in that way. But for that to happen, one culture has to be open to allow that process to happen. And if we look at Māori, we, we notice that Māori is an open culture. So from the 17 and 18 to the 1850s, um, Māori um, brought in European technologies and beliefs into their cultural frame. We had Māori travelling from New Zealand to, to, to Australia and to the UK to learn new technologies and to bring them back. And so what you had happen here is the formation of three elements. The first one is what was retained was strong elements of Māori culture. And this, there's lots of elements, but I've just included the ones I've talked about today. So whakapapa Māori, mana, te reo Māori was retained during this period. Then there was a whole lot of European technologies that were brought in, like transport, weaponry, literacy, machinery, construction. And all of these elements were brought into Māori culture. But there was another element also brought in was, of course, the Christian traditions. They became syncretic traditions because Māori brought them in and they combined them with their existing traditions to create indigenised Christian traditions. And we see those with the Hororingatū and all these other Māori indigenous Christian traditions with their own prophets and their own ways of operating. So, um, and we can, see, we can see the impact of this. And this is just one quote from one place in New Zealand. Um, so it's from Hazel Petrie and she notes in 1857, that Matatua uh, and Tufari Toa had over 3,000 acres in wheat, 3,000 acres in potatoes, uh, 2,000 acres in maize, over 1,000 acres in kumara. And uh, this figure suggests a rate of almost 1.2 you know, acres per head under cultivation um, compared to 1.9 by Europeans. The tribes owned 2,000 horses, 200 head of cattle, 5,000 pigs, four water powered mills, 96 ploughs. 43 ships averaging 20 tonnes and over 900 canoes. So that's one iwi um, back in 18, uh, 1857. Now that was replicated across much of New Zealand, Tainui, Naitahu was doing things like this down here too. So there was, um, uh, you know, there was quite a strong economic growth period through the incorporation of Western ideas and technologies. However, we have this uh, early colonisation period so just taking you back to the picture we had before, we had the original syncretic and European sort of elements. But by the 1850s, these had become Māori. They'd become brought into the culture and incorporated, and a new culture had formed by then. But what we also find just with colonisation is the relationship was one way. So we had Anglo beliefs, traditions flowing into Māori culture, but they weren't flowing back. It wasn't, it wasn't a cross-cultural relationship. There was some happening, but very little. And so what we then see is the assimilation period. So this was an attempt to, um, to essentially make Māori uh, uh, Anglo. And so this was an attempt where these original cultural frames, these original cultural foundations, whakapapa Māori, mana te reo, so forth, it was an attempt to get rid of those and also an attempt to get rid of uh, the indigenous Christian traditions and to make uh, Māori uh, European, in a sense. 
And then we go into a revitalization period. Now this is a little bit different. So you can see here we have Maori culture, we have the original culture on the outside. Um, and then we have these Anglo traditions, they're still flowing into Maori culture. But what you have is a critical filter. So Maori being like, well, we like some ideas, not other ideas. We'll let some in, reject other things. But we also have a strengthening of sort of traditional Maori knowledges starting to flow back through. So they get much stronger. At the same time, Māori have got all these influences from around the world, philosophers, academics, different ways of economic thinking, and that's all starting to flow into Māori culture as well. And so we then end up with this sort of situation here where there's all these various technologies from the outside, there's various intellectual, philosophical, religious traditions flowing in, Māori Buddhists, for example, and Māori culture keeps evolving and changing as it brings it in. But the core framework, that original framework, the Whakapapa Māori, these sort of elements still are retained and hold that culture together as a frame. And now we're in this, um, now we're in this period. So uh, the contemporary period. So we've got this historic one where the relationship was one way. Now what New Zealand's trying to do is form a two-way relationship. Um, that's just how I see it. So it's kind of the challenge we have at the moment. So we've got this Anglo cultures, beliefs, and other cultures as New Zealand evolves and changes flowing in. Maori culture here, the syncretic culture. But the challenge is, is to create this two-way, uh, particularly flowing from Maori back to Anglo culture. And that's where you see a lot of resistance to this, but also a lot of interest and passion more generally across New Zealand to be able for this to facilitate this type of process. And so I think that's kind of that challenge we're dealing with. And I think this fits into um, Angus McFarlane's braided river type approach where he often uses this image where the braided rivers show different cultures coming together and coming apart and coming together and how there's this idea of, of creativity that comes when cultures come together and relate to each other in that way. And uh, my view is Māori work right across. They work in, they're bicultural in that sense. They work right across cultures, quite open. So Māori culturally open, open to new technologies and ideas that fit within the cultural frame. Moving from one to two way cross-cultural relationships. And um, so now I'm gonna start going to technology and to uh, with the, all of those sort of uh, founding uh, concepts in mind. So um, what am I most interested in is um, how we can monitor our non-human relations, our tipuna, in that sense, and how we can bring high tech in to do this. Now on the left-hand side, you can see a patient in the hospital and uh, they're hooked up to a machine and there's a printout of all their blood results and how, how they are in terms of their health. It's a similar thing happening in the environmental sphere. So here we have uh, different uh, atua, um, different spheres, and how are they going? What's their health like? What's their well-being like? And how might we also get these readouts of their health in detail so we know how they're going? Because until we have a good idea of their health in detail, we don't know really how to act or what to do to make them well or what to stop doing uh, to do so. So this is, uh, so to me, this is where I see uh, this new age we're moving into of technology is, is really interesting and important for Māori. And particularly with that openness I outlined before, that openness to incorporate uh, that, this new type of knowledge into uh, a Māori framework. Now, there's these, all these new technologies coming out right now. And uh, what's key about them is the cost of them is rapidly falling. And I'm, I'm gonna run through some of those technologies shortly. And given that the increasing wealth of iwi and Māori land trusts and corporations, they can start to afford some of these technologies to monitor the health of uh, the whenua and awa. There's also uh, the parliamentary commissioner for the environment um, he's had several reports out now saying there's a lack of clear government leadership in the area. We're not really doing proper environmental monitoring in New Zealand. And um, he's also found that it was um, really fragmented. So what we're in regional councils doing here is different from another regional council, what the Ministry for the Environment's doing. And there's no uh, standardisation, so they don't use common rules around how they gather things. It's all spread out everywhere. Industry's doing its own monitoring central government region, and there's not a lot of conversations between them around how they go about doing this. And so what we're doing and what the 
Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment found is this is a major reason for our continuing environmental deterioration, is a lack of precision monitoring information. And also, without good monitoring on the ground, good precision monitoring, you can't also do good modelling. You can't work out what's happening in modelling systems and understand how they work without this information flowing through. So what I think is there's a lot of space for iwi to invest in these opportunities. And I'm working with uh, various iwi, Te Arawa and uh, Naitahu, to explore these opportunities, which I'll, I'll go into in a bit more detail. And so what are the technologies? So this is the first one, uh, so multispectral and hyperspectral imaging. The engineers in here, uh, if there's some, will be all over this stuff. <clears throat> so what you have here is, um, you know, down the left-hand side, you've got different aerial um, vehicles, um, satellites, planes, drones. What they do is they have sensors on them, and, and you know, as sunlight comes down, the, uh, that sunlight reflects back to these, to these um, aerial vehicles. And they can um, get this high resolution um, information from them. And what happens is it's not just like a photo where you're just looking at a whole range of colors. But uh, if you look up here, there's a whole huge spectrum. So there's only a small part of that's a visible spectrum. <coughs> Excuse me. But there's a whole range of spectrums like the infrared spectrum. Now, they have these cameras and sensors pick all this up. And what they do is they um, get, can get very high resolution data, particularly drones and things, down to below a centimeter or even down to millimeters over the environment. And what we can do then is we take those, those different spectral layers and we can pull them apart and we can identify different things. So over here you can see here we're identifying different trees uh, within a forest ecosystem so we can determine the health of that ecosystem. And with the development of AI, artificial intelligence and machine learning, these algorithms can go through and scrape all the information and data and work out what things are and we're through training, training them. What it enables us to do is develop these spe spectral signatures here for all the different types of vegetation so across, across an area. And so we can label them and know what things are. And, uh, but it also enables us to detect things like pollution. So if there's an algal balloon, some of these infrared ends of the spectrum will go, go off in the waterways and we can see that there's blooms forming and things like that. It tells us how much is, you know, nutrients and things are flowing off the land. Here's another one, light detection and ranging, LIDAR. Um, and uh, I don't know if any of you have watched any of the, some of the documentaries on Sky, but they're often using this these days to fly over the Amazon jungle and find old cities and things like that because of the way it works. But, so once again, these area vehicles, but this time they send a beam down and that beam goes down and it goes through for this, in this case, a forest canopy. And then uh, as the light, as the light beams, beams back, it gives you these profiles. So here you can see a profile of a forest that's been had a LIDAR go over it. it. Gives you really high definition of forest structures and the amount of biomass, the canopy height of forests, the understory density, things like that. Could tell us, you know, and from that we can work out and classify forests, for example, wetlands. We can work out how the amount of biomass in them. We can work out, um, you know, the um, how much biodiversity is there and elements like that. It tells us in, uh, the richness of something. Now this is a program I'm co-leading, um, the Eco-Index Project. It's a national program. But uh, this is where we're doing using these technologies for biodiversity. And so this is where we're using the satellites and the artificial intelligence information. Um, we're working with Te Arawa, um, with A2 Milk, Marino, some of the industries. And what we're doing there is to be able to classify biodiversity, work out species richness, um, and through you know using AI to go through these, uh, scrape these images and data sets. And what we're trying to do is develop these uh, uh, these pictures of all the different species, uh, different ecosystem types, their extent, um, all those sort of elements. But we're also trying to be able to do it down to a really low scale, so right down to a farm scale, be able to work out at a farm, you know, what type of uh, how biodiverse that area is, and so on. And this is another program that we're um, working in, the Naitahu Centre. We're partnering with Methane Sat. So this is a satellite that popped up to look at methane emissions from land. So down here you can see a little picture. So, you know, there's a satellite with a, um, a, uh, a, a detector on it or a sensor, and it's picking up methane coming in from, from, a, from land in this point. So this new technology can 
go over and show, uh, give a profile of farms across the country of how much methane is being emitted from farmland. So it gives you very accurate levels. And now they're partnering also with GNGSAT, and this is once again using satellites, but it shows you where all the greenhouse gases are coming from. And this technology is getting more and more accurate, so we could be able to see you know, who's emitting what greenhouse gases where. So once you start working out you know, what biodiversity is like, where the greenhouse gases are being emitted from, where methane is being emitted from, and all of these from these external detectors, and down to a very high, high resolution level, down to farmland or you know, even, even lower, down to per square metre, then you can get a really clear idea of where, in terms of coming back to some of those ideas before, who, to what extent are we you know, harming the whenua? What, in what ways are we decreasing the modi of these things? And we can do that in real time. Um, there's also these other elements, so this is the Rongawai, prog uh, Rongawai program, which we're also NTC is, has a relationship with uh, through the Geospatial Research Institute here at uh, UC. And so what they're doing here is they've got a radar that's attached to the bottom of a Air New Zealand Q300 aircraft, and it flies over the country. And it's a ground penetrating radar, so it goes a metre under the ground, and it goes up and down the country many, many times a day, and it tells you how much water is sitting on the surface and underneath the ground. Well, then, and it also has a multispectral camera, which also tells us levels of pollution, you know, things like uh, nutrients, outfalls, and so on. Now, what that does is it enables the hydrologist to be able to model these systems, to understand how much water's where and how it's moving through the soil or moving down rivers, all this sort of stuff. It gives these pictures, soil moisture and surface water, water extent, but it does it every day uh, or even multiple times a day. So you're starting to build up these big pictures of the environment, starting to understand that environment. Then there's all the things being done on the ground too. So Naitahu Farming's just started a regenerative farming program. So they've got nitrate sensors all over their farm, which is telling how much nitrate's coming down through the soil, um, constant monitoring, 24-7, um, which is all linked by, um, by you know, 4G. And you can look on your phone or on the computer and see how much nitrogen's flowing in to soil from the um, dairy farming. Also, eDNA is another technology that's emerging. So this is where this is going on a stream and a sensor, and you can see here, all the different, uh, I can tell you all the different species that are in that stream um, and the abundance of them. So these statistical methods to say, oh, we found genetic material from these different species and then they can also work out the abundance of the species within an area to tell you the biodiversity within a stream. Um, once again, so there's a, you know, all these uh, technologies and how, the, and, and how they combine is quite interesting. So this leads us to um, sort of where I'm at at the moment with some of uh, my work. So um, just found out yesterday we're getting funded by the Our Land of Water Science Challenge to scope all of these technologies and see how they all fit together and how e we can use them within their cultural framework to report environmentally and to do all the costings of that. And so this is – and so um, – and so this is what we're going to be building, and you can see it up here with, um, uh, so with the idea being that we're reporting back against these different spheres, against these different atua, across these different areas, with this idea that we'll be able to find out the balance levels. Are we in balance? Are we imbalanced? Is it an ascending balance or a descending balance? Is Modi being enhanced? Is mana being enhanced in these relationships? And um, yeah, so it's an 18-month program where we're working with different iwi to explore that and Māori land trusts and corporations. So what are the future around this? So one element is you get to know, um, you get to know uh, what's happening out there through the application of these technologies and investing in them. So that gives iwi a really good idea of what's happening environmentally so they can form good policy uh, in themselves. The second is holding governments and industries to account in situations where they are negatively impacting the modi and the mana of the environment. And in that sense, potential breaches of the tetiriti in terms of this partnership obligation. Also, as Māori, you have a very strong sense of kaitiaki obligations to care for, for things. And so also to meet this need to feel like you're doing something, that you're actually protecting it, that you know how, what the health is, like that picture before of the person in the hospital, you can see the current health of your non-human relations and then you can work to um, address uh, problems as you see them and to advocate on their behalf. 
But there's also commercial advantages with this stuff. So given that I was telling you through before that it's kind of fragmented, government doesn't have good data, well, there's a big market in selling that data back to governments, back to regional councils. Currently, they have to go into the private sector to get this information, and it's usually pretty average. So there's this real opportunity to sell information back. Now, there's another area which is rapidly growing, which is insurance, assurance systems. Now, what they are is, or well, you might, a good place to approach this is through, um, through climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. So to create a market for greenhouse, uh, you know, to pay people for um, storing or sequestering carbon, first of all, we have to work out how much carbon is being sequestered. And this has been a big project in New Zealand lately, like uh, to try and work out how much carbon's been sequestered. And they're using a lot of these technologies, the multispectral limiting, the LIDAR, and these sort of things to work out how much carbon's been sequestered. But there's and because you can't set up a market and you can't pay for somebody for something until you know you're getting something, right? You need to show that you're actually sequestering the carbon before someone will pay for it. And so, because there was a whole lot of issues with people, you know, early on when they set up carbon trading in Eastern Europe, people were taking carbon credits and not putting in forests and just pocketing the money. And so you need these kind of assurance systems. Now, these assurance systems are developing in lots of areas. There's assurance systems developing for biodiversity as well, so markets for biodiversity as well as carbon, so quality carbon, um, and a range of other things too. So, um, and people in markets around the world, so when you look at the EU, they're starting to put a lot of pressure on New Zealand farmers and growers um, to meet their environmental standards in Europe. And they want to have, be assured, they want to have verification that what we're doing here isn't harming the environment. So a lot of markets are now demanding this assurance to come back. But we don't have good data on how good we're going. So we need, that's where we have this uh, capacity to, um, for, um, it's a long-term project, but to ha there's a, a co commercial opportunity there for a verification and assurance. And also providing data to insurance industries. So insurance industries, of course, they, they carry a lot of risk and they want to know what's happening in the environment, you know, whether it's flood risks or other risks. So having hydrological data, things like that, also has sort of uh, commercial opportunities in the insurance industries. And also, probably really importantly, uh, monitoring iwi corporate farming and forestry initiatives to determine their environmental impact and to guide best practice uh, for regenerative farming and forestry. So this, once again, this is primarily what's driving Naitahu and a lot of these uh, relationships uh, that we're having is to get good, high-quality environmental data on their own operations to ensure their own operations are sustainable. And also, there's a lot of burden on people, uh, farmers and foresters, about how they have to do environmental reporting, so reporting back to councils, reporting and so forth. So we may be able to automate that stuff so to take pressure off businesses so they can get on doing uh, what they normally do and we do all their reporting remotely uh, or taking care of it for them. So um, that's me. So do we have any um, uh, questions? Question, Jace. <laughs> uh, kia ora, John. Uh, nā mihi mō te kōrero. Uh, just wondering, um, so we've had, got the sense of Māori that we've had hmm. a long time as Māori, and just now we're kind of leveraging uh, the Western technologies to sort of um, show what impacts have been done like mm. in, in our kind of farmlands and that sort of thing. Um, what's, has there been like the um, demand for that to be put in place like by, like it's, is it by us or is it by say um, our westernised um, uh, colleagues to, to kind of show that, sure. you know, we've undermined um, the Modi of the, of the whenua? It's, it's coming internally. Yeah. 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 So yeah. there's really strong drivers internally uh, for this stuff huge pressure, particularly on uh, iwi corporate farming, forestry activities, huge pressure from their own people constantly and demand for good data and pushing these technologies. So yeah, it's absolutely coming from the communities themselves and not coming from the corporations themselves, but yeah. it's definitely coming from the communities. Yeah, because I mean, it doesn't sound like that they'd 
basically bother if we didn't you know stomp our feet about it so yep yeah exactly <laughs> and yes. it's great that um as yep. maori we can adopt these technologies quite nicely because i think we can yeah really show um, mm. how to correct some of these things agreed yeah yes Kia ora. Yep. Kia ora. Any other questions across the room? Lindsay? Um, this may show me up as the non engineer in the room, but <laughs> can this work for um, the Y as well, the water, like, say, monitoring Kaikoura's water health? Um, yeah. And, and the dolphins and the tuna and stuff through the um, estuaries and things? Yes, yeah, so I know it's certainly been used for counting uh, mammals. And, um, so using satellites has been, um, those satellites that go over frequently have been used to count uh, whales and dolphins and numbers. Uh, it can be used in multiple uh, ways in the marine environment as well. And John's a way more, probably way more qualified to speak on <laughs> that than me, but no. <laughs> <And> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so there's, um, yeah, there's, ad, um, yeah, it can be, it's got all those sort of applications. Once again, the DNA technology being used, you can take water samples, you can work out, it's even being used, starting to be used in the QMS uh, in terms of the genetic samples to tell us what populations there are, their genetic diversity, what quantities there are. Um, so it's becoming far more precise and certainly the management, of the, that's the quota management system, QMS. Um, so yeah, all of those same technologies apply to the marine estate. Thank you for the talk. It's really exciting. It was, it was a really lovely talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Kia ora. Thank you for your kōrero. I find the technology part really interesting, mm. probably because I have no knowledge around it. Um, but my question, I might have two questions. So just wondering if you're working with Kippa Morgan on that Modi model that he yeah, had well, research well, around. Yeah, you probably heard before on Ngāti Piki also. Yeah, and oh. Kippa and I have been working together okay. Yeah, we're on a couple of adjacent projects as well cool but um yeah the modiometer yeah we've uh, applied uh, applied that i can, um, to, I can yeah. see where it's yeah. coming through yeah my other question is about um environmental monitoring so usually there's baselines right that yes. you have to work from yes. to determine how mm. much of an impact or effect there are yes. in the environment so yes. just wondering if you knew if government's looking at doing perhaps a a, a, a all round baseline where everyone works from <laughs> <laughs> to determine yes. all of those impacts. Yes. Um, I'm not aware of any, but just wondering if you had this, any idea. And there were some of those comments I was making before about standardisation. One is standardised what you measure, how you measure, how frequently you measure, those sort of things. There's not good standardisation around that. That's the first f factor. The second thing is thresholds. Um, you know, or what you're talking about, for, you know, where's the starting point? Yeah. And, 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 and setting targets and things like that. But, you know, we're in ecology and other disciplines where that sometimes we don't know historically where things were, you know, how abundant things were. So we often don't know where to set um, that target. And we've been running into that in the Eco Index. Like, do we set New Zealand's biodiversity quality at 1840 or do we do it start at 1400 or do we, you know, and then we've got climate change. So, uh, so everything's shifting, uh, you know, species are moving south, some areas are getting drier, some wetter. And so it's hard to, it's going to be very difficult to set the baselines of where you start on some of these things. But at the end of the day, you've got to make a call and, uh, and you've got to make a call where you start measuring from and why, what targets you want to reach and all that sort of thing. And, you know, that happens through that sort of discussion, but it's, you know, well informed by science, really well informed by Te Ao Māori different iwi perspectives. Um, we've worked on that, uh, certainly in the Eco Index, doing the biodiversity stuff for a few years, and you know, we've managed to arrive at some, uh, what I think are pretty good baselines for measuring what, um, biodiversity, and certainly setting targets of where we want things to head over the next 100 years, and setting long-term targets, because environmental change takes time, and uh, you know, it took 100, you know, over 100 years, 150 years to get to a point of this deterioration and so, certainly some ecosystems and it'll take another 150 years to launch our way back out of them, yeah. Thank you, it's been really interesting. Mm. Uh, ka mahi e tarakatera, uh, mō te kaupapa nei. Um, just two pātai, they're kind of related I guess, but one is, you know, how how's this going to fit in with, like how are you incorporating some of our uh, understanding of like cultural impact assessments and how mm. you can use these kind of data with all the learnings that we've had from 
the complexities of building cultural impact mm. assessments yeah, sure. into the mix. And then the other one is really uh, a question of scale. So mm. here, I think the, the, this corridor was sort of main, mainly applying to iwi whanui rather than to our hapu or runanga at the mm. real local level of, and, and just thinking about, you know, how does it tie in with, with sort of runanga level mm. interaction in this space with, you know, expressions of, you know, of tapuai or, you know, walking the whenua and, and ground truthing all of this stuff. Is it, you know, how do we get our runanga to, yeah. to participate in this kind of yeah. kaupapa? So Kaupapa. that was really, um, those are really good points. Um, and um, one thing is the technology is limited. It's not going to capture that heartfelt connection to a place. It's going to be able to, you know, it's like analogy back to the hospital with the patient, you know. You might be able to see some readouts to thinking that they're not well, but it doesn't, you know, the family standing around having a heartfelt connection to the, to the patient or how they've cared for them all their life and know how to care for them. It's not, you know, it's not going to replace that sort of element, that sort of crucial element, which I think that cultural impact assessment fits inside of. Because I think that's that other part of Modi I was talking about. There's the quantitative, but then there's the qualitative. There's the felt element. There's the connection element. And to me, the two should work in synergy. So, but I think some ways you could bring that, some of those things into the technology would be alongside those readouts of, say, for example, um, the water health of a place. You might also be uploading waiata of, of the, about that place or the types of connections and stories people have of that place. So you ground that data into that felt experience that makes you know being Indigenous unique in that very place. So I think that's how the two kind of fit together and I think the technology can facilitate that. How do you get runanga engagement, hapu engagement? So. And this is what's quite interesting. So let's say we're saying the eco index is just using this example. So we're doing biodiversity across the country, but we can drill right down to a takiwa, we can drill right down to a farm, and we could do a report for them of their particular takiwa and the abundance of biodiversity and scores within their area based on what this external sensing is saying. And I know from, you know, we've been testing this with Tiarawa, I know working with some of those hapu that when you start, start getting some of those maps, <laughs> showing the abundance of areas and they, you know, people start to get engaged. They're like, oh, wow, this is really interesting. And what also connects with as well is that it starts to go, well, that's not my experience. You know, this data's telling me this, but my experience is something else. And it also starts to, to have that conversation starting to happen. And we can use that to ground truth the technology. So sometimes the technology's out. You know, sometimes that sensing's out, but we can ground truth it using people's felt knowledge, experiences, um, histories, um, you know, all that, whakaaro, all that, that stuff. Yeah. Kia ora. Any, any last questions? Uh, kia ora, John. I um, appreciate the talk, and it was uh, very much enjoyable. I saw a lot of connections there with some of the work that we do in the biological sciences. Um, just there's an observation and it speaks to your marine question is there's a lot of work doing the satellite imagery and a lot of fine scale work mm. on um, climate impact in terms of the upper and that you know that's southern oscillations the mm. heat waves and impacts mm. on our seafood industry so there's a whole heap of mm. uh, interest in that side and what we do in aquaculture and the wild fisheries um, and also sediment plumes coming over our rivers in terms of satellite mm. monitoring um, so yeah, there's a lot of work, and it's a concern in terms of how things are going to impact our cultural, but you know, to mm. cultural practice. And so it was a great talk to to hear those connections and across the, mm. the spectrum of New Zealand. Being a sort of an academic and a teacher, how do you see us bring in more rangatahi in terms of educating in the sciences? And I'm very science driven because that's where I sit. Mm. But mm. I'd like to see more of our people in that space being able to to, to run to. Um, to hold on to that, to that information and IP so we can drive that research. Um, mm. um, do you see a, an opportunity for um, more engagement in that space from our people across uh, Aotearoa? Oh, I think there absolutely is because I know there's a real passion and interest in the technology, a real interest. We've struggled though to get uh, rangatahi coming in through to study these areas, particularly more in the engineering end of things. There is interest there. We do have, have found some, but then getting them to come into this particular area is, of, is often a, is a little bit of a struggle because, you know, but, 
you know, years ago I used to have the education portfolio for Naitahu and one thing we always found is about age 12, you know, uh, Māori tend to drop out of the sciences and maths and these sort of areas, uh, although they're doing well in those areas up until that point. So there's something happening in that transition to secondary school. So I think some of those problems go back to schooling systems, way back to, you know, year 12, year 13. Um, something's happening there. And we know there's some great institutes that are, are starting to, oh, I forget the name of it now, was it Massey, but um, have had incredible success rates of retaining Māori into, in, in the... Um, you know, in the sciences and uh, engineering and associated fields, and uh, you know, 95% retention rates from you know. So I know that it's possible to do this, but I think it goes right back in building those skills right back at that area and um, and having the right approach through secondary school, um, and then. Um, but I think then the passion is, you know, comes of its own <laughs> on itself when you see what the potential is. Uh, with the technologies and the ideas, um, and how they can be uh, how they can be applied. So I don't see a sudden solution, but I know there's a lot of interest. I mean, I've got some young uh, Corey Ruha, for example, a young engineer, Maori engineer from Te Arawa. He's heavily involved in all this stuff. So, um, so they're coming. There's some coming through, but uh, few and far between. Kia ora, John. That's such an awesome presentation and really cool work that mm -hmm. you're doing. So it's really good to hear about it. And um, just thinking about the connections into law as mm. you're talking, um, which we talk about. Mm. Um, and you talked about what perhaps what's not happening already in answer to Adrian's question and earlier around um, what the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment was saying. So what's your sense, um, and I don't know how much you can say about it, but what's your sense about what the Crown is doing now or planning to do through the Natural and Built Environments Act and these regional strategies. Mm. Um, and I suppose well, what regional authorities are doing either here or in the North Island. I mean, I suppose there's a lot of your presentation is just getting on and getting it done and not waiting for the Crown, but mm. I'll be interested to know what you think. Like, Do you have much hope about what's being done in the public sector? Um, so I don't know... Um, and specifically in relation to the act that you spoke about, but I, we have been heavily engaged with the Ministry for the Minis Ministry for the Environment, including with the Minister and also with the Parliamentary Commissioner and also with MPI on some of this, these technologies and developments. And um, I think what's really stood out to me is how small their teams are. You know, like for Ministry for the Environment, you might have four or five people trying to run a lot of the stuff, Stats NZ, their environment teams, two people, two of whom, are, both of whom are currently over doing COVID-related issues. Um, MPI is better resourced, but they're productivity focused um, rather than environmental protection focused. Um, so, from my viewpoint, uh, I, you know, they're starting to contract people in to do these pieces of work, um, particularly using multispectral imaging, lidar, and that sort of thing to you know, ascertaining quantities and levels of native biodiversity and ecosystem extent, but um, they're, t they're the tiny fragments of the whole. And um, yeah, so generally speaking, but um, when I did notice that well, we had a meeting with the minister the other week, the minister, the, and he was very interested, um, sort of got it, because the, some of these technologies are small investments for big outcomes. And there's a whole lot of other things um, happening in that space. So I think there is, um, I think it's on a cusp. I think there's a growing realisation amongst entities, the need for greater coordination, greater awareness. So I do think it is starting to, um, you know, sort of, yeah, being drawn together as some sort of realisation. But once again, as I was saying, the, the capacity in New Zealand's tiny and the teams are tiny. This needs to be a whole of government effort. We actually pulled together, created a forum which for private and public sector um, players working in the remote sensing, you know, high resolution data area. And we meet every month um, to bring, try and coordinate and bring everybody together across sectors. And uh, we've had really good turnouts um, for that and really good engagement, particularly from the private sector. So I think, um, yeah, between, yeah, and I, I noticed the CRIs are also working on an integrated data platform where they're bringing all their information into one point and trying to standardise and that sort of thing. But once again, it needs really high level national leadership. And that's where I think Māori, because they're so focused in this area, I think it's much easier to get full traction amongst Māori on something of this nature. 
and that they can drive this, uh, you know, that type of momentum, uh, or create the momentum in that area. Kia ora. Kia ora, John. Thanks for coming and sharing with us today. I know you're incredibly busy. Um, you have such a, a breadth of research you're across and such a deep knowledge in all those spaces. I don't know how you find the time to, to sleep, so if we could just um, thank, thank John for sharing today. Um, we also have morning tea that everyone's welcome to come and uh, join us with just through there. So if um, everyone can join me in the karakia for kai, that would be great. Uh, no mai i nā hua o te nahiri, o te whenua, o te wai Māori, o te wai tai. Kia ora. I'm pretty sure if you had the hundred of you, you would still be busy. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Yeah, sure, Kirst. That was recorded, right? Yeah. Okay. Hey, um, just at the start there, um, uh, John was telling me something. He goes, this isn't being recorded, right? And I think it might have. It's okay, I can cut it out. Yeah, yeah. it's thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah, good, Jace. How are you going? Thank you. Cheers. Yes. I do wonder if some of those qualitative things could be made conscious now. Yes, no, that, that's for all. Thinking well being. Well, if we get to Puhiki, <laughs> I've got six years to, <laughs> to work on that. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that could certainly do that. Yes. Yes, yeah. Well, that's the thing. Once we get, if we get it high enough resolution, when we can start to pinpoint the pollution rising. Oh yeah. Uh, are you busy? Yeah, we're just giving a talk, and we're just having a <laughs> having a, a meeting. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, sure. Yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah. The more we can get people's thoughts and feelings from a space, the more Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so I've, I've actually got a paper out on it right now on that very topic. I'm trying to capture intangible, tangible properties. Yeah. So the emotions that you feel from a place. Oh, take this one. I don't think so. There's technology in Yeah.